Welcome everybody to another observability clinic today with a new layout and uh, theme, as you can see here from the slides. Thank you so much for our marketing and creative team. Uh, we got some new logos and some new branding. Today's topic, how Dynatrace saved my life from a broken Kubernetes cluster. I am the one that is not dealing with broken Kubernetes clusters today. For this, I have Henrik. Henrik, welcome to the show. Thank you for this introduction, Andy. So yes, we're going to talk about Kubernetes and we're going to talk heavily about Kubernetes. And in fact, to prepare this content today, I have uh, tried to reproduce a couple of uh, production outages. And in fact, I have, I have broke several clusters, in fact. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's learn and you'll see that those problems uh, you could definitely face. Through. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's an easy way of getting to those situations. So let's Without waiting anymore, let's see what we are going to talk about and what we're going to learn from this session. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. Uh, I'm using real production use cases, real production stories that happen in a uh, in very popular brand of the industry. And everyone was using and relying service mesh. So um, here the, uh, the idea is now we're going to say that service mesh is bad. It's great. But there are a few things that we should consider when we use service mesh. So we're going to talk about that. And of course, in order to avoid those outages that happen for those customers, we will see how Danatrace could help you with our predefined outages. Mm -hmm. So that will be today, of course, as you understand, we're going to see the latest news related to Kubernetes and with that we have uh, recently added into Danatrace. And you will see you will just love it. And last, of course, we have two problems to, that we're going to talk about. The one will be more on the alerting side, and the other one will be more on Davis detecting problems based on Kubernetes events. Awesome. All right, let's, let's not wait anymore. And for this, I have a small intro. I mentioned Service Mesh, so I don't know how much you know about Service Mesh. So I need to explain what is Service Mesh. So, as you know, in Kubernetes, there are several ways of exposing your service out of the cluster. You can use different solution. You have service with a load balancer type, you have ingresses, and the, one of the feature provided by service mesh is also providing ingress. So service mesh can expose traffic out of the cluster, but it doesn't only do this. When we design our microservices architecture, we have to deal with a couple of features that are really crit critical to make sure that we are able to communicate between different services. So we have a couple of features. So either we can add those features in our code. So let's say the retry logic. So I have a service A and service B. If I'm not able to reach the service E, then I will probably retry. So that's what we call the retry logic. The second use case is authentication. So I may need to uh, reach out to service B, but I have a specific authentication process to respect. So uh, probably I will need to code that as well in my code to be able to handle that authentication. Last, is I may need to put SSL, but here it's not gonna, not gonna be through code. Uh, and it's great to have SSL, but we need to rotate those certificates because if we don't rotate, then we are not secure. And last, we have plenty of other type of uh, feature that we wanna add when you build microservices observability, of course. This is one of the core topic of today's um, traffic split, if you do blue green deployment, uh, rate limit, and more. So this is something we need to uh, to support and handle when we start building microservice architecture. And the good news is that we don't have to code those features because there's a platform called Service Mesh that will help us to implement most of the features that I just described. How do you do that? Well, we deploy, first of all, the solution in the cluster, and they will add a couple of new custom resource definition objects, so CRDs in your Kubernetes cluster, and it will basically add in top of your container. So we just have to focus on the features of our, that we want to deliver to our users. So that's the application container. And it will inject a sidecar proxy that will manage all those features for us. So observability, security, application, security, and so on. So that's fantastic. I'm so excited about that. But how do you do that? Well, we don't have to go and adjust all our workload. We don't have to do that. We basically deploy our, our service mesh and it comes with a control plane and we do the settings from the control plane perspective. And when we have added the settings of retry log and retry logic and others, then the control plane injects the proxy in all of our containers that are we want to use service mesh, of course. And then uh, the service mesh is in place and we have the data plane. So what the data plane is 
at the end what we have in our all the proxies that are being deployed. All right, so now I think you have enough information to understand the next, the problems that I'm gonna talk about. So without waiting anymore, let's start with the first problem. Once upon a time, a well-known booking platform that you may have heard uh, and you may probably have used it. So I use it personally to go on vacations. Um, so they faced a major production error. And by the way, this story comes from a KubeCon talk. So you can check it out on YouTube, search for uh, uh, an outage from uh, this company, and you will find that story. And the story is funny is that they were running and they come in the morning and say, oh, hey, all the nodes are saturated. What happened during the night? Something is wrong here. So they started to check all the cluster and they were looking at an abnormal number of pods. There was like 600 plus pods compared to the normal situation. And those pods were doing nothing. So it's zombie spot. So what is a zombie spot? Let's have a look. And by the way, happy Halloween. Um, so that's, that's probably coming, coming up. Uh, yeah. So what, what was the initial reason for that? So basically this company, and they want to basically uh, get, understand your user uh, behavior on the website, uh, the, your search that you're doing on that website, because you want to provide recommendations. And all, most of the recommendation that they do is based on, on batches. So they have batch running that will collect analytics. And to do that, to run batch in, in Kubernetes, you use clone jobs. And so that, jo that batch existed, but the, what happened, they just deployed a few days before a service mesh. So the service mesh was freshly deployed, used, everyone was happy. And all, uh, all the, the jobs that were started were all in running. And in fact, you will see, I will explain why in the, in the second slide. So the job starts and then you suddenly we see that we have 500 pods running right the job and this is not normal. And because of Kubernetes, you know, if a pod has been started, Kubernetes allocate the memory and the CPU. So if there are skip, if they are staying there in the cluster, it means that they are still allocating resources. So at the end, you didn't have any memory and, and CPU left. And at the end, the cluster were basically very hard to operate because you didn't have any healthy loads to operate. So why did it happen? It was because Chrome jobs is just a job. So what's the, the story behind it? All right, let me remind you the definition of a Chrome job. So a Chrome job allow you to schedule a task in your cluster. Okay, from here, we know that. Then when the pod starts, the pod starts uh, in the, so when we have a cron job, the cron job starts and you will start a pod and that pod will run to do what he has to do. And once it's been ended, so the, the, the basically the, the container and the pod ends, then the cron job ends the task. So the pod is deleted and we can schedule the next job. Okay. So why did, they, why did this company face that problem? Well, if you have a sidecar proxy, which is the case with the service mesh, then your app may have a state. So we run, it has a, a process, it ends the, pro, the, jo the job, but then Kubernetes is waiting that all the containers end. So if I inject my proxy in this batch, but suddenly the proxy never ends because it's a threat. So Kubernetes thinks that the job is not ending. So it keeps running, keeps let, it lets that pod running forever. So at the end, as you understand, all the resources were eating by this problem. So how can we resolve this? So we know it's a problem. It's based on the definition of a job. So if you inject a, a sidecar container, yes, you can face to that problem. It's very easy to reproduce, by the way. So, couple of uh, recommendations. First, let's see on the specification object uh, aspect. So first, I from a job perspective, I can add some settings. First of all, I will pr probably put concurrent policy replace. So which means if that prop patterns happens, instead of having thousands of pods, I only have one pod. Uh, so at least I'm controlling the resource usage. That's a bit better. Then we have active deadline seconds, but still it won't resolve a problem. It will limit the problem. And last, creating a resource quota on the namespace, which means if I run that, that job in a namespace and there's a resource quota, I'm limiting the impact. If we be, with the help of a resource quota, I'm not killing my cluster, I'm killing just that, that namespace. So now how can I stop that proc, that sidecar container that runs in the pod? Because this is what we are looking, fishing for. So first solution, imagine we have app and a proxy. So the proxy is not a, 
let, let's not take say that it's a proxy. We say that the, the traditional sidecar proxy. So the first thing I can do, I can use a file. So my app starts, so the, the job runs. And that once the task has been ended, I can imagine to write a file. And because we are sharing uh, the file systems with uh, the next container, the next container can check that file. If it exists, yes, then it can stop. All right, does this solution in the paper works fine. But in the case of service mesh, it means that we'll have to rewrite the entire pro uh, proxy. <laughs> and, and I don't want to do that. It's too complicated for me. So, so what are the second solution? The second solution is great because it's been implemented by all the service mesh of the industry. So my app runs. And then when I have my app finishing the task, I would need to send an HTTP POST request to the proxy. And that prox HTTP POST request will kill the proxy, which means it ends. And at the end, our app will start and our pod will be released. <sighs> we resolve that problem. So here is the link, by the way, if you want to implement that for Linkerd and Istio, this, those are the two endpoints to shut down uh, the local uh, sidecar proxy. Hey, Henrik, uh, can I just quickly interject here? Yes. That means these two uh, uh, URLs that you just gave because of the sidecar, it's localhost, obviously, it's always the same ports. It's always the same port. Always the same one. It's called because quit, it's on quit, the quit. container level. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Because you are in the same environment, it's going to be always the same. Perfect. And uh, I know this this might be new for some people completely. And if you're really interested in learning more about service meshes, Henrik, I already posted the link earlier in the chat to your, is it observable? So folks, if you are interested in learning more in general about observability, about service meshes, about Kubernetes, Henrik is doing a fantastic job with his is it observable IO website. So uh, check it out. I posted it into the link. And as a last uh, thing, a reminder, um, do me a favor, if you have questions, put them into the question feature. And also one interesting piece from my side would be, if you are using a service mesh right now, I would be interested in it as well. So please use the Q&A feature and let me know if you're using a service mesh and if so, which one, just out of curiosity, which service meshes are used out there. Thank you. And also for my curiosity, you, you, uh, I was you were interested to be, if you were aware of that uh, pattern of the mm -hmm. zombie pod, because it's, it's something that uh, if you type it on internet, you will see that lots of people have faced that problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we covered the problem. So how can Danatrace help me? Mm -hmm. Well, first, as you know, we have a Danatrace operator that you will deploy in a cluster. And that operator will collect logs, will collect events, metrics, traces. Uh, we will have the health of all the different components. So it's fantastic. But that is not enough. So let's see. First, I don't know how long you've been aware of the latest update we've been released, but to remind you, we have done so many things over the month. First, a couple of months back, we introduced our new Danatrace operator. And that operator introduced a new way of injecting uh, our, uh, our Danatrace agents with the cloud native injection. And side to that cloud native injections, we had something that was for early adapter or was not for necessarily uh, flagged as GA, called the CSI driver. The CSI driver is a way for us to have a folder, a, a, a volume that is mapped between all our agents so we can share information, we can share the image of the one agent. So basically when we spin up and we inject the agent in your pod, we are faster. And also just to, to as a quick reminder, because of the new cloud native injections, we are creating a rule in the admission controller, which means when Kubernetes has to schedule a workload, no, Dynatrace is, uh, is aware, and we will create an init container where we inject our code module. So we will always be there before your pods. So at the end, we resolve lots of issue, more stable. So for those who are, that is using a Dynatrace operator that is version 0.3 or 0 0.4, we are now currently on the 09 version, so I would definitely recommend to upgrade to the latest and greatest Dynatrace operator because tons of features has been added, and all the things that we're going to see today will be the, with the help of a latest operator. So make sure to upgrade. Upgrade. That's a small reminder, but again, it's here, it's out there, and especially the CSI driver is in GA now supported, so you can use it, and you could be uh, you can trust Dynatrace. Uh, everything will work smoothly on this one. So. Now, what will would happen in a few weeks? Because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a feature that will be efficient, officially available in November. Um, Danatrace provides out of the box 
alerting in Kubernetes. And Kubernetes, to remind, is like an onion. So you have the user outside of the cluster, and then you get out and you have the different layers. So you have the cluster, and the cluster you have different nodes. And in the node, you can you have namespaces, and in, within the namespace, you have a workload, and in the workload, you have parts. So we what we've built is a system alerts on different levels. So first, I want to be notified when users are, un are unhappy in terms of response and failure rate. Good news, Davis is automatically detecting this. So I don't have to create extra alerting. Davis will pick it up for me. So response times increase or failure rate increase. So that, that is not the news. Then we jump into the cluster. We have, so that, that's the, the main entity. So we, I want to be alerted when my cluster is not healthy, is not up and running. I want to be alerted when, for example, if there is a CPU request saturation or a memory request saturation, it could be a sign there's a problem on the node. So this is also out of the box alerting that we have just added. We also did the same thing from the node. So the node, there are several sta several uh, status, could be ready or running. And if it's not ready, then it cannot be, we cannot schedule a new workload on that. So that's the danger. So we will send alerts about that situation. Same thing, all the alerting about memory, uh, uh, request saturation, memory, uh, the mem CPU and memory request saturation, and if there are too many pods running, you would be alerted as well. If you jump to the layer underneath, which is the namespace, of course, we will do alerting about your resource quota. If you over-consume uh, the resources based on the quota you define, you will get also notified. And last, on the workload, we want to be aware if I have often pods restarting with crash to back off, for example, if the pods are not ready, if there are pods pending, we are not able to basically make those pods running. It's probably there is something wrong on the nodes or on the namespace. I want to be aware. And this comes automated. But I can hear you. I can see your face, Andy. And here you're saying, please, it's not enough. I want more. I want more. <laughs> yes. Wait a bit. In a few months. In a couple of months, we will add more and more alerting. So this is just a start. We just put the first brick on the wall, and we're going to add, 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 add more and more alerting. So if you want phishing for OMKill events alerting on your workload, you will be notified. You don't have to wait until Davis pick it up. You will have alert based on this. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. That's mm -hmm. great. So I, I saw I always saw you, I saw your face. I, I, I thought you, you wanted more. Uh, the, and, and I, I know I, you. Yeah. I know you. Yeah, but I, I want to say. Uh, first of all, I love the animated GIF. Can you just quickly go back and, and to show the list again of things? Basically, what you're telling me, because I have never heard about zombie pods before, and I'm pretty sure I've never heard about many other things before that could potentially go wrong. So, but we are already doing a great step in automatically detecting these well-known patterns that um, that you would otherwise need to either you know figure out yourself, uh, defining your own alerts on it, but we are automatically detecting them and i think that's the that's the nice thing nobody can be an expert in everything and know every problem pattern dynatrace is there and detects it for you and i think this is the great message and there will be even more coming up and Makes me happy what is even better is we know you probably operate clusters and you know that every team has different requirements and different needs and it's awful but you have to manage them don't worry we thought about that and in the way you can configure those alerting could be at the different level. So first, we, when you enable the alerting, will be at a tenant level. So all the cluster connected to that Dynatrace tenant will have the same alert. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I have the option to customize my alert on my cluster because mm -hmm. my cluster is completely different from the others and I want to have a specific threshold. I don't want to have the standard one because my cluster is crucial. Okay, but we thought about that use case. Mm -hmm. I guess, the, um, Henrik, maybe just for, from, from my understanding as well, I would assume if we have a dev cluster or a testing cluster, right? It's, that's why you want to have probably different settings, first of all, be, because of the environment, because you have different requirements on the environment and you're less worried about in a dev environment, things can go wrong and you may not want to get alerted on certain things where in a production environment, you have more stringent um, uh, alerting rules because there it really matters if something is wrong. Yeah, or, or even if you know that, you're, for example, you have a specific workload where you generate a lot of pods and yeah. the memory can grow very fast. Maybe you want to change the alerting to be notified earlier than mm -hmm. tra traditional thresholds. So you, you have the, the flex, you're flexible to com customize the level of alerting based on, on different levels. So yeah. the, the tenant is the, the main one. Then you can have customized the cluster level. 
-hmm. and thus you can go to the namespace saying, oh, my namespace is for, I don't know, a specific app that I know how it consumes, so I want to be notified in a different way. Mm -hmm. So this is great because at least it gives the, you are flexible to customize alerting based on the, your, the, the different team members that has different requirements for sure. Yeah, awesome. The other thing that we updated is our dashboard. So we, we, when we deploy the operator and you get everything, you have, you have a couple of uh, predefined dashboards for Kubernetes and all of those dashboards have been upgraded. And you'll see through the first story that I mentioned, I usually use the dashboard because it helped me to figure out an abnormal number of uh, workload running. Mm -hmm. And what is great is then when I browse into those Kubernetes screens, and there is a, a quick link to jump back to, the, to your Kubernetes dashboards. And all the, the, the context will be applied as a filter in the dashboard. So then it's an even better user experience when you, you'd have to troubleshoot. So enough of talking about slides. I think you probably, I'm pretty sure that you want to see that. And don't worry, I'm going to show that. And for this, let me remind you, I've prepared an environment. So it was very funny. So uh, when my kids say, what do, you, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm creating production outage. Oh, that's a pretty cool job. So, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. So here is a link on a GitHub repo here. You can get it, take it, take it, deploy it on your cluster. Don't, in, no, don't do it in production, of course, because you will see in three days, uh, you will have your cluster will be, will be dead. Uh, but it's, it's pretty, quite easy to reproduce. So what do we have here? We have Linkerd as a service mesh. Of course, we have Dynatrace, the Dynatrace operator. In this environment, I'm using the official open telemetry demo. Uh, which produce 100% of open telemetry signals and traces and metrics. Um, and it has a cron job that generates a load test. So to deploy my various component of open telemetry, I use the open telemetry operator uh, that comes with a couple of collectors. So I have a main collector in the default namespace that will basically exchange uh, the various signals to Dynatrace. And last, we have another namespace with another app, if it's a shop. Same thing, cron jobs here triggering a K6 load test. So, Basically, this uh, situation I've tested on two namespaces, and uh, so I'm, 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 it's easy to to kill the cluster. Mm -hmm. So let's open Dynatrace. So what I will start doing in Dynatrace. Oh, before I do, so here is basically the 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 URL to the repo. Uh, all the instructions are here. So if you uh, if if you someone is asking in organization, hey, can you kill my cluster tomorrow? I say, yeah, no problem. I know how to do that. Uh, just use that repo, and it will work perfectly. So. Mm -hmm. Here, I will start with the dashboard. So I'm starting with uh, the dashboards of the cluster overview. So in the form of the cluster overview, like I said, this is an update, a new dashboard that we provide. Uh, we are provide, we are built uh, with the, the new release of, of the, the operator. So uh, here, and you can see that we have a couple of tiles that help you to figure out the health of the various cluster that you have, uh, how many pods are running, on the various uh, namespaces, uh, the memory allocated. And you can see that I have a couple of nodes here that are started to be quite heavily uh, used, uh, allocated in terms of CPU and memory is I'm, I'm still good. So on the cluster side, I don't see some major problems. I just, so I want maybe to jump into the second dashboard, which is the workload dashboard. The workload dashboard is here. You will see the various, uh, you also have a resource uh, dashboard by the way. But here I would be able, in the case of this uh, 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 Chrome jobs, to see if I have abnormal number of containers. So, in here I can see first of all the, the CPU request, what the, mo the most the most uh, one that has uh, some throttle. So at least with this dashboard, I have a pretty good understanding. I can see that the front end of the hipster shop generate a lot of out of memory kills, and I know why. Uh, that's that's me. And then I have a lot of also the restarts. So I have pretty much a lot of information that so it's very useful to, to go from there. But of course, when you're gonna troubleshoot, you're gonna jump in the community screens that we have here. So showing first of all, all the cluster that you have, uh, uh, that is uh, pushing information to uh, your tenant. So here I'm selecting the one that I've prepared for this uh, observatory clinic. And I will like to go to the namespace and you will see that here, I already have configured uh, the alerting and custom alerting by namespace. You can see that the hipster shop is already red here. So I'm notified that I have two problems related to those namespace. So let's have a look at how you configure that. So I mentioned the alerting. So a few things. So first, the alerting could be done on settings. And in the settings of Dynatrace, 
there is the anomaly detection rules. So I'm going to jump in the anomaly detection rules, which is here. And you can see that on the bottom, we have Kubernetes. So here, this part of the settings is for the tenant. Once I apply this, uh, all the alerting that I just mentioned will be applied for all the cluster connected to uh, that tenant with our rules. So here I have enabled the cluster alerting, the node alerting, the, uh, all the alerting that we already have available. But then, if I, how do I do, how do I customize my alerts based on a given namespace? So for this, I jump to again Kubernetes, and here I can either select a cluster, and here by the set going on the settings of the cluster. I would have now an extra menu uh, dedicated for that cluster where I can overwrite the settings for this given cluster on uh, the alerting for the cluster, the node, the namespace, and the workload. Okay, now I mentioned the namespace. So we can select one of the namespace that has the uh, alert that you have we, that we just uh, saw a few minutes ago. So let's pick the hotel demo. And here we can see that first we have three problems. So problems are, are opened and connected to the you can see that we have a lot of memory and CPU saturations. So this is, uh, uh, we expected because this is what I was trying to fish. Um, and here, if I want to configure a dedicated alerting for the namespace, same thing, very simple. I just have to click on settings and in settings, you can see that I can configure a custom uh, thresholds for uh, my main space and custom thresholds for uh, the workload. So you are pretty much flexible and it's very easy to jump and uh, co configure those alerts. Uh, but here, um, um, so I think I covered the, yeah. yeah Henrik, maybe one, right. one quick uh, ask. Could you zoom in a little bit more? Uh, I know you have a big screen probably, just maybe a little bit in the browser. That would be great. Thank you so much. And also, um, just a reminder, use the Q&A feature. Um, I already started answering some of the questions. I will bring them up later as well. Um, but yeah, just thanks, Henrik. Really good stuff. So before we jump to the next use case, uh, here you can see that I have 17 alerts. Uh, you know, I told you I'm here to generate problems. So uh, this is how I, how I was able to generate all of them. So you can see that uh, without any configuration of alerting, I had some alerting on the various namespaces. I have a couple of pods that are not, not ready because in fact, it's a consequence of the resource quota. So they are, they are not able to start. They are pending in fact. Uh, so. I have out of the box plenty of alerts, so it's it's very easy. So when I operate um, my cluster, I'm I'm aware uh, in advance of something, and then I can even think about putting some uh, remediation to avoid or resolve the problem that we just observed. All right, so that's the first story. Uh, let's jump to the next one. Oh, where is my mouse? Here it is. All right, so the next one. Okay, another horror story. So it's a bit different now. The story that I'm going to refer is the same company. Um, so in here, what they had a major outage during a production in the middle of the day, completely. And it was related to one of the backend services uh, used by the, the uh, again, recommendation. So here, the recommendation used the data that has been collected through the cone jobs. And then uh, it requires another a service to be able to provide the recommendation on the web UI. And when they drill down, they discovered, and this is not a pattern from Kubernetes that we already know, it's quite weird. It's say, oh, we discovered that CPU limits can cause OMKL events. Mm, but OMKL events is related to memory. Well, 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 how can how can that happen? Okay, let's jump into the problem. So like I said, this company has a recommendation service and it, the recommendation service depends on a dependency called the add service. And the add service is written in Java. And of course they're using a service mesh. It's all, it's uh, the story, uh, it's today's or most of the, the theme of today's uh, um, session. And what we are look, when you looked at the resource usage of the add service, first we saw that we have an increase of the memory usage. And we reach out a certain level of the heap usage. So as you know, when you reach a certain level of heap usage in, uh, in Java, what happened? There is a garbage collector running. And if there's a garbage collector running, what do you expect? Some, mem some CPU usage. All right, so now let's have a look. So once the service mesh is injected in, the, in our proxy, in our containers, in, in any case, all the communication go through the proxy. So here, the recommendation will going through the linkerd proxy, reaching out to the second 
a Likert proxy on the add service uh, pod, and that that reverse proxy uh, that proxy is basically reaching out to the ad service. At that moment, remember we had. Do I have? Hello. Yeah, you're still there. Okay, no, because uh, because you you were freezing frozen, so I was thinking. Oh, Sorry, no, I lost no, network. No. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so the. At that moment, uh, the memory usage was high, so garbage collector. But because of the CPU limit, what do you what do you expect? You've been throttled. So the garbage collector start to run, but it's been throttled uh, by uh, by Kubernetes. In fact, by by the container world, so not able to release memory because of the throttle. So at that moment, this pod is not healthy. We can assume that it's not called healthy. But what happened? The problem is that the, the our workload has some CPU and memory defined, but the revert the sidecar proxy has no request and limit defined, which means my container app is under pressure, is healthy, but the proxy is healthy, which means if I have another request coming in, then it continues sending request to my application, and my application is suffering. And as a consequence, boom, my container has been killed. But as a way I'm killed it. Why? Because we were not able to clean up the memory of through by running garbage collector because we were mm -hmm. throttled. And in the request will keep coming in, coming in, coming in through the reverse proxy. And that killed my pod. So this is a real story. So that's why if you put request and limits on your workload and you use service mesh, there you need to define annotations on your workload. Those annotations will basically define also constraints on the memory allocations and the CPU allocations that you may uh, define on the sidecar proxy. So if I want to avoid that situation, yes, I need to put a decent CPU uh, limit, so a memory limit on Istio or Linkerd, whatever service mesh you use, so then that situation won't happen because also that reverse proxy will be throttled and the service mesh will be aware that it's not available. So I won't receive any incoming traffic and kill that container. All right, so now we understand that concept, but how can Denetrace help us? Well, for this well, small reminding, we have introduced several months ago, uh, we, we sent Davis to the Kubernetes uh, event uh, master uh, 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 um, university um, and Davis learned a lot of things about Kubernetes. So now Kubernetes, I mean, Davis is using uh, Kubernetes events to when he detects issues. So if I have an issue from the user perspective, which is uh, increase in of response times, or I have uh, an increase of failure rate, then he starts analyzing, and if it sees that one of the workload and uh, that is uh, one of the dependencies had a high CPU throttling uh, behavior or a whim kill, uh, then we will basically put that card, and you will understand why. And this great thing that we just introduced, of course, we do also evictions and others, but the great thing that I love is that when I decided to change my workload definitions, and I changed the request and limits because I, I did a mistake, which happens. Then Danetrace will say, hey, there's been some, some kill, OM kill event. And by the way, there's been a workload spec change. So maybe this kill event is related to a change that has been applied on the workload definition. So, so very efficient to, uh, to, to troubleshoot that, that situation. The other thing that we introduced as well as uh, in that case, we, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the reverse proxy is injected and it becomes a service and the service is very important. So I need to get some service details information. And since this new release now, we have a service screen that allows you to see the uh, different uh, uh, network uh, settings that has been defined in that particular service. You get a couple of metrics about the response times, the failure rate and so on. And what we intend to do in the future, so that is not available yet, we want to integrate service mesh information to that particular screen. So then you will have even more information about your service, how they're going, any routing capabilities that you may have applied. So enough of speaking, let's jump into a demo as well. 
So as a demo, oh, uh, as a demo, same environment I'm using here. Where is it? I'm using here up the up. So, so here in my case, it's a quite particular use case because I have uh, I'm using a, a solution by the way on the cross you dimension. I have deployed Chaos Mesh. It's another chaos engineering tool, and I'm injecting a heap increase on a Java uh, part. So here again, it's not the same situation as the, as the production, but I try to reproduce it as much as possible. So what do we have here? A couple of things. So here, first of all, if I jump to the um, to the uh, one of the workload a namespace, let's pick it up the hotel demo that we looked at before. So this is the namespace screen, and in the namespace screen, I can see all the various uh, workload available and also i can see all the services mm -hmm. oh that's new so if i jump for example i know that my service that has a problem is this one um, so here i have a dedicated service screen where i can see which part i served by that uh, th that is exposing that services uh, the different definitions so i know it's a grpc port uh, and i also have the events at and logs related to that particular service so it's even a helper. So you can see here, I have the container link and the proxy. So I'm aware of different information. So here, if I'm fishing for information about a service, I will definitely look at the service screen. So now uh, in our case, uh, in my case, I use this one. So I have reproduced, but again, this particular problem that I'm facing is not visible from the user because it's just a service side of that. So Davis is not picking up because there is no response. Uh, there is no uh, increase of response times or failure rate mm -hmm. increase. But here you can obviously see that I have some high TP throttling. I have some memory. And if you look at, on the bottom on the events, uh, you will see that I have some killing. So a couple of uh, OM kill had happened. So I was able to reproduce the problem. But if you take the example of a service that is serving a user, where uh, if that particular pod is down or have an OM kill, obviously I will have some failure rate increase or, or, or I will have some response times increase. And to here I have two examples. So uh, let me zoom in because not for some reason this slide is not. Um, so here it's, a, it's, a, it's again uh, from a hipster shop and you can see that the uh, front end service has increased. So we have increased the, basically we did, a, we did some, uh, some false deployment and I can see we have an OM kill uh, has been detected. So the failure increase is related to that, uh, to that uh, event where we have an OM kill and we have a couple of custom events as well. So you can see that everything uh, you are aware of, it's a given situation happens, uh, why this service has been, why the response times has been uh, increasing because one of the critical services has been basically killed by computer names. Same thing on the workload change. So here I have an example with a, a workload change. If I see it, do I see it? Uh, oh, no. Yeah, configuration change. You can see here, uh, there, there's been, um, I mean, you can do it from a different way, but if you have a workload change, it will be also considered in the problem card uh, uh, that has been dictated by Dynatrace. So then combining the customer, uh, the out-of-the-box alerting with the capabilities that we, that uh, that Davies provide you, then you can operate your cluster in a more smooth way and avoid critical situations. Mm -hmm. And now for me, uh, Henrik, sorry to jump in here. For me, the fascinating thing is always that we're not looking at these events in isolation. We're always looking at them in the context of your application because we always combine these events with the topology information we have through the distributed traces, whether this comes in through open telemetry or whether this comes in through our one agent. And this is for me the, the great thing. And then knowing that Davis now detects all of these Kubernetes specific uh, events and kind of patterns, problem patterns, and then brings it up and bubbles it up uh, into the problem tickets. And so also we're not getting individual alerts. We're getting one alert here, one problem as we call it, with all the root cause information, including all of the Kubernetes events that are part of that root cause. And yeah, and, and uh, I, I, would, I would have loved to show you uh... Uh, to reproduce the the story, uh, so I tried several times, but again uh, with the dashboard we provided to summarize and the alert mm -hmm. out of the box alerting in Davis, then it's easier for sure to operate uh, your mm -hmm. cluster. So one before we, I have a small surprise. So we covered the thing that we wanted to share about the news, and but I still want 
Oh, ah, that's why I have my main screen that is. Ah, okay. Uh, that's why I'm not able to. Okay, that's interesting. I'm seeing your chaos tool now and now the energy is again. Yeah, in case but you I'm not know. able to go, go back to. But get two seconds, I need to do this because it's, I have my main screen that is freezed. Sure, okay, so and just... while, while you're doing this, uh, let me just quickly answer some of the questions that came in. Torsten, I have answered hopefully your question because you were asking about ta automated tagging and inheriting tags uh, on namespaces and workloads as well. And uh, I sent you a link to a recent uh, uh, observability clinic that I did with uh, Reinhard Weber. He actually covered this, uh, some advanced uh, tagging. Uh, Henrik, your screen currently is completely black on my side, just to yep. give you some feedback Sorry, I'm as I'm answering more questions. And then uh, the there was another question, but I had a follow-up. It was on um, the alerting on resources. This is great, but for private cloud and infrastructure, what are the best options and best practices for cluster management and dimensioning? Uh, I responded to that question with a follow-up. Um, whoever you are, because you're showing up here as anonymous, let me know if you are talking about how to use Dynatrace for capacity planning, then we can definitely cover this. But now, Henrik, back to you to the last section with about 15 minutes left. Uh, let's and make this sure. Is, yeah. This is, uh, I know it's not Christmas, but I wanted to give you a small gift, guys. Uh, one thing is, I know that today we are facing an energy crisis. Uh, we, we are concerned about the consumptions, electric consumptions, and and anything like this. So, when we work in IT, how can I also provide an angle? And and because we so, so since, since several months, we've been focused on the cost of a cluster, the resource utilization of the cluster. But what about the power consumptions? And for this, I just want to end this web, this uh, observability clinic with this topic, uh, because there is a project out there called Kepler. So, Project Kepler is. Uh, an open source solution that uh, is available uh, on GitHub. I will have the, I have the link. Some I will show you the link in a few seconds. So the Kepler is very simple. It's a daemon set running on all your uh, nodes of your cluster. It has a serv uh, service endpoint as well. And the way it does, it's basically inject eBPF programs on the nodes uh, to uh, look at the CPU instructions, the GPU instructions, the package instructions, the memory instructions, and all the things and estimates the, the basically the, the usage of uh, those components in millijoule. So then you can convert that into a kilowatt per hour or a kilowatt per second. I mean, you're free to do that. And the great thing is it's exposed Prometheus metrics out of the box. So what I did for today, I have in the repo that I just shared a few minutes ago, uh, there is a, there is a, a Dynatrace uh, dashboard, uh, JSON format. So you can import the, this dashboard I just showed you on the screen with the power consumption. So you can keep track on my node usage in terms of uh, milliwatt uh, and also the, the, the namespace usage. The, you can go to the pod level. So it's just fantastic on that. Mm -hmm. So and how by do you the just... way, I shared, I, I, for everybody, I shared the link to the Git repository earlier as well as many other links that uh, Henrik has shown. So check it out. So how do you ingest that data in Dynatrace? There are plenty of way so quick reminder, as you probably know, we have the uh, Prometheus metric ingest uh, support. So our active gates that is deployed with our uh, Dynatrace operator uh, can scrap uh, metrics from your, your Prometheus exporters. So to do that, you will have to add annotations on the pods producing uh, uh, Prometheus metrics. You, here are the an, an example of annotations. And in the core, in the case of Kepler, it used the port 9102. So this is the settings that you should may apply if you want to let the activate scrap. The other solution is very uh, part of also the, the, the news of the market. It's open telemetry. It's, it's growing so fast and, and there's so much use case with open telemetry. And open telemetry provide a component called the collector. And collector is a way of receiving, processing the, med, the, the signals received in the collector and pushing it somewhere. So you can also use a collector and for this, I can receive, I can configure a Prometheus exporter. This is an example on the right side. You can see that I've configured a Prometheus. I scrapped the Kepler service. And once I scrapped the Kepler service, I want basically to send it to Dynatrace. So basically with the help, I'm able to do the same thing that, that we do with the active gate, but here with the collector. So both options are, are fine, but at least you have the, the choice and you can play around with that. So if you're interested to measure this, 
check it out the Kepler project. It makes sense. Uh, it's a way also to give a feedback to the project lead of your organizations about, hey, your your project is consuming a lot of energy. It's not green. So it's, all, it's a way of measuring how green uh, your code is at the moment. So a couple of key takeaways uh, key take before we end this uh, session. First, on the community side, uh, of course, resource quota. We mentioned that several times. Uh, it's very important. Define a request and limits. Putting resource quota on a namespace will save your life for sure and avoid uh, uh, impacting all your clusters. Uh, and if you operate with service mesh, it means that you will have some sidecar containers injected everywhere. So uh, define resource limits on the sidecar. If you define jobs, make sure that you end the sidecar to avoid major problems. On the other thing, yes, we want to be alerted. So we need to alert at various level of the cluster, the cluster, the nodes, the namespace, the workload. And what is great from today's, what we learned is that Janet Trace will do it out of the box without major effort. So that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And last, in terms of observability, because we mentioned that with briefly with Kepler, Janet Trace is able to to collect metrics with our components, so agents or operator or the data trace operator, but we have lots of ingest endpoints for metrics, for logs, for open telemetry traces. So ingest external data to enrich the level of visibility, and then you will be have more data to deal with, and you will have more options to create fancy and customized alerting. Before we end, and we come to the to the last piece, which is Q and A. Keep in mind that Easy Observable is here. Uh, I try to produce content as, as a, in a regular pace. Uh, and uh, most of the topic we discussed today is part of one of the episodes that I, I already pro provided on, on YouTube. So check it out. And basically to improve the content, I need feedback. So if you watch the content, give me a feedback saying, hey, it's you need to change this and this and this. And with that, I will be able to improve my show. All right, so thanks. A couple of materials. Out there, we did several clinics about uh, Kubernetes, so you can check it out. It's available on YouTube. Uh, if you don't have a SaaS uh, Dan and Trace tenant, don't be frustrated. We are happy to give you a, a trial so you can try it out and, and enjoy. Uh, we have a couple of training materials out there, and uh, Andy is producing a, a pretty good podcast called Pure Performance, so check it out. There's always great uh, guests part of that podcast, you can learn tons of things out of that. And last, of course, there is Is It Observable. Mm. All right, so let's start the q Wow. Hendrik, thank you so much. It's always fantastic because I always thought I talk a lot because I have, and fast, because I have a lot to say. But listening to you for 50 minutes, it's amazing that uh, the amount of information that you just shared. What I took away from all of this is service meshes are obviously an important uh, component in microservice architectures, but they're also the source of many problems, outages that uh, we had. You showed two today from uh, a very prominent booking platform. So thank you so much for this. It's great that you're giving best practices on how to avoid these things, but even better is that we also know that Dynatrace is built for detecting these problem patterns fully automatically. So thank you for this. I um, wanna say, uh, because timely, it fits perfectly. The Pure Performance podcast that you highlighted, we actually had uh, the last session, the last uh, podcast was with our friends uh, from uh, Akamas. Um, and uh, we might hand, we both know them pretty well. And uh, we did a session, or I did a, a recording with them on, let me just link, uh, post the link in there. It's about uh, optimizing performance and cost of a Kubernetes cluster talk about Kubernetes today, right? I think that's also uh, something worth checking out. Check out the chat. Henrik, um, we got about a couple of minutes left. I want to quickly iterate again the uh, the questions. Um, can the workload and namespace entities inherit tags from the processes like hosts can do? Uh, that would be important to assign responsibilities to that resource. Uh, I did. I mean, you wanna, you wanna take uh, your so take workload on it? namespace or or entities are different, of course. Um, if you wanna create management zone, if that's what you expect to do, um, in uh, in in Dynatrace, you can easily do that uh, in one click. There's a, a options to do that if you click on the cluster. 
and there is an option to say here you can say create a management create a management zone uh, and that will create several rules uh, for uh, the all the various objects part namespace and so on because what is important to uh, keep keep in mind is that you can mark you can uh, basically observe your cluster with a full stack a cloud native full stack where we have information about the host or you can disable uh, if you don't want to use the full stack uh, we will collect a couple of metric level uh, of health level uh, me uh, metrics and, and events but are using the kubernetes api uh, so you won't have the host information anymore but if you want to also uh, filter the services related to that cluster yes i would recommend to create a, a tag at the service level uh, so you can create a custom tag and then once you have the custom tag to match your services related to that given cluster for example then you can update the management zone by adding a, 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 a rule based on the tag and that will basically handle your managements for zones for your cluster but also the services and all the things related to the tag mm -hmm. and also to add to this because i think the question was also about inheritance so inheriting tags from processes down to the workload or the namespace and one thing that I highlighted, I did a recent clinic with uh, Reinhard Weber, and he showed at the very end some examples of automated tagging rules uh, for entities without tagging support. And uh, I think he gave some really great examples on, on how to do this. Um, so check this out. I posted the link earlier, Torsten. And Henrik, the, the other question that I wanted to highlight quickly, and, and you have a lot of expertise in this because you're playing around a lot with load testing and performance engineering and capacity planning tools. Uh, any recommendations on uh, best practices of, of cluster dimensioning? I think this is the question that came in. Um, any Because you, obviously it's great that you get alerted in case you're running out of resources, but you also want to make sure that you size it right in case you're not running on Kubernetes managed services in the public clouds where they scale for you? So that's that's a next on question. So for this, again, the cluster sizing is one thing, but also the workload resource definition. So the request and limit. So I have a, a talk, by the way, that will be a P99 about that topic. So do to able, able to test a request and limit uh, are you in workload to define the right one because you don't want to be killed because out of the memory or you don't want to be throttled because the limits of the CPU is not well defined. There is no magic. So a load test uh, and then look at the what you get out uh, would be very important to get that uh, that uh, the feedback. Uh, but then for the cluster sizing, it's always a matter of, okay, what do I would what do I want to put in a cluster and then assimilate. And then it's going to be one, not one load test, but because you probably have several applications, you need to make this workload running and, and, and basically generate some CPU or usage uh, to have a realistic test, but this could be a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But again, keep in mind that usually the cluster we have in testing will never be reflected to the production. So probably you have less nodes. So what I would do is probably node drain, so remove a couple of nodes to, to have a, a situation where you are more realistic and then uh, test it out from there. But yes, uh, sizing of the cluster, uh, is a fully uh, task that you need, but a lot of people, a lot of a project is using auto auto scalers, auto, uh, algorithm to auto scale nodes based on their users usage. So you mm -hmm. can also uh, recover from that. But again, that auto scaling is great, but it has a cost. But mm -hmm. you will have to also observe the cost of the cluster and and optimize it um, to avoid uh, spending too much on on and nodes that you don't utilize because there is. If you, again, if I rephrase it, if you don't define properly your request and limits, if you define two, two higher values more than expect than you need, then those resources will be allocated, similar to the story we mentioned with cron jobs. Mm -hmm. So your nodes are basically there is no CPU left, so no way to allocate more pods on this, even if those pods are not doing anything. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that resource and limits is really really crucial uh, to optimize a bit more the usage of your nodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for the reminder of P99Conf that's happening, I think, tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I just posted the link to the conference and the agenda. So if you search for Henrik's name, you will uh, find the talk there. Hey, Henrik, thank you so much. I think we are at the end of the hour. Also, this has been recorded. The recording will be available both on Dynatrace University as well as on our YouTube channel, where you find all the other clinics. 
And Henrik, I cannot just uh, say it one, um, again, you know, as many times as I, I would love to say it even more. Is it observable? Is it observable? Is it observable? This is your uh, channel where you are providing great content um, and uh, just phenomenal for me to see what you've been doing. Yeah. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. I'm going to cry now. No, don't cry. <laughs> don't cry for me, Henrik. Um, and uh, maybe one last question just came in. Is it possible to add tags on the code level to show on Dynatrace, e.g. add a tag on the Kubernetes YAML? Yes, you can add tags, labels, right? Everything that you put in into your deployment YAML, Dynatrace will pick it up. You can then use this for your filtering, like what you say with the management zones. You can use it for tagging. You can use it for access control. Um, you can filter search all of this. Okay. Yep. All right. Great. Again, thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you. For those of you who are at KubeCon in Detroit next week, we will be there. Check us out. Find the find us at the Dynatrace booth, at the Captain booth, or anywhere else. Or at the bar. Or at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. See you. Au revoir. Bye-bye.